Hi Sligo Jazz folks. I'm here to talk to you about ear training. Now, if you're in a university jazz program or a, some kind of music school program, you might have a class in ear training where they give you intervals and you have to tell them... Wrong! Uh, where you have to transcribe things, you have to hear things, and identify the intervals and the melodic patterns and the rhythmic patterns by ear. That's a worthwhile endeavor, as is transcription, transcribing a Paul Chambers bass solo or a Hank Mobley tenor saxophone solo or the Herbie Hancock voicings on uh, Speak Like a Child. You know, those are all valuable things to do. But I'm going to give you a practical ear training lesson. I want you to take a tune you know and play it on your instrument in all 12 keys. So let's take Happy Birthday, because you're always gonna play this for someone. Uh, yeah, we'll play it in the key of F. Melody starts on a C, and it goes like this. Okay, the key of F, pretty friendly key, that works well. Uh, but, you know, if you go to Aunt Edna's birthday party and Uncle Frank starts to sing, he's not going to turn around to you and say, oh, what key do you prefer to play happy birthday in? He's just going to start singing, so he might be in D major. don't want to screw up Aunt Edna's birthday. She'll always remember that, that, uh, you know, you were the one, you were that person who came and screwed up happy birthday. So yeah, start hearing happy birthday in your head and, uh, yeah, work on it through all 12 keys. You could start in D major, like we just did, and then move it up to E flat. And so on. Uh, you know, most people sing Happy Birthday in 3-4. If you want to do a jazzy version, um, you know, 4-4 four, four is also good. It's similar to rhythm changes. Uh, it's Happy Birthday changes. Okay, here we go. for all you folks who had birthdays this week. So a big question that I get asked pretty often is what syllables do I use? And I feel like the most important thing to consider is articulation. If you are focusing on articulation, then that will inform the syllables because at the end of the day, that is the most important thing. Why are we transcribing this solo? 
we're trying to match this artist as much as we can and the biggest factor is articulation. So if we're doing our best to match his articulation, it doesn't really leave us many options for the syllables, it will kind of come naturally. So I'd like to use a portion of his solo as an example. <laughs> So, just that section. As you can tell, in this section of the solo, he is articulating that in such a way that he is sliding into each note. He's not going And if I were to sing that line in that way, my articulation wouldn't match him at all. He's going So it doesn't necessarily matter which syllables I'm using as long as I'm matching that articulation in that line. And that leads me to another point. When I approach learning an instrumental solo, I'm not thinking about the notes as mentioned earlier. I'm not thinking vertically. I'm thinking in terms of the line, but I'm also asking myself, how long is he holding out the note? Is he using vibrato the whole time? Or is he having a straight tone? Does he have a straight tone, but then uses just a little bit of vibrato on the end? Is the vibrato fast? Is it slow? How is he accenting each note? How is he articulating? These are things that I'm asking myself in my head as I'm learning this solo. So as you can see, it goes much deeper than just learning the notes on the page. I'd also like to share with you doodle tonguing technique. And this is something that is massively helpful when learning instrumental solos. And it sounds like this. So if I were to learn a fast solo, for example, I would use that technique. I'm using the tongue. To get that articulation. Um, but you can also apply it. So there is a section in this solo where he goes And if you notice, I'm not using my mouth at all. I'm just using my tongue. This allows me to have more agility and it makes learning these lines a lot easier because if I were to go you see how it kind of slows me down? It doesn't work. So for me personally, I, I use that technique. So let me find that section actually. I'll play along with him just so you can see what it sounds like. So again, matching the articulation of the instrument is going to inform your syllables and it's going to get you to line up with that soloist as close as possible. Permutation number four. This uses a number system of one, two, three, one. Okay? Okay, so that is permutation number four. Permutation number five. This uses uh, the number system one, three, five, three. So the jumps are slightly bigger. Also, if you um, want, you can use these chromatically as well. So you can, um, you know, move, do the chromatic movement. And 
and so forth. Permutation number six, this is one of my favorites uh, because it uses a combination of uh, various numbers. So this is one, two, three, five, but then coming back, it goes one, five, three, one. So it kind of turns back on itself and uh, sounds like this. But yeah, uh, also, if you start high, you can kind of like turn it around and come down and then go up again. So it sounds like this. So that's your one, two, three, five. And then five, so one, five, three, one. And then move through the keys. So you can also kind of do it from the bottom and then do a couple of one, two, three, fives and then turn it around again to five, no, one, five, three, one. from this one Another harmony focused video today. Today we're going to be talking about diminished scales and I'm sure you're wondering why do I need to know them? What's the importance of them? Well, the answer is they give you some really great sounds and some really great modern jazz sounds to help your improvisations really go to the next level. So stay tuned. I'm going to talk you through how we you play them, how we make them, and how they're used. See you in a sec. Let's start with talking about diminished chords. There's a diminished chord. has that really unique sound. A diminished chord is made up of stacked minor thirds. C up to E flat is a minor third. E flat up to G flat is a minor third. G flat up to A is a minor third. So whenever we look at constructing a scale that connects all these, we make sure that we connect all of these notes in the scale. And there's two ways I can get from C up to E flat. I can go through D flat, or I can go through D. And then this is repeated up the scale. So if I play, let's say, up to D, what I'm playing is a whole step, and then a half step. Repeated whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step. This is called the C whole step, half step diminished scale. It sounds like this. The next one is the opposite. Instead of going whole step, half step, I'm playing half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step. It sounds like this. So that is the half step, whole step. They sound broadly similar. This is the whole step, half step scale again. And the half step, whole step scale. And it's important to note that each of these scales does hit the notes of the C diminished chord. C, E flat, F sharp, A. But they have different applications when we're talking about harmony. And this is the, this is the important part about diminished scales. If we see a C7 
and you want to start using diminished harmony, we only use the half step, whole step. Why? Because there's our C7, C, E, G, B flat. E, G, B flat. If I play the other diminished scale, it doesn't hit any of the notes of C7. No. 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 So anytime I'm playing over a C7 and I want some really crunchy harmony, half step, whole step. So I would use this on something like Caravan. So that's the half step, whole step for use over uh, dominant seven chords. Now if I saw a C diminished chord. And diminished chords aren't really all that popular in jazz, but you do see them in tunes like Wave. The second chord in Wave is B flat diminished. And I can use either for a diminished, but what I really like is I really like the whole step, half step. I just love that sound of the ninth on top of the chord. So it's important to remember those two uses over C7, half step, whole step, over C diminished, whole step, half step. I hope that was clear enough for you guys. Diminished scales are a bit of a weird thing, but once you get the hang of them and once you get through them in all 12 keys, they really will make your solo sound, give them that really great modern sound. So go and get practicing. See you in the next one. Bye bye. Hello and welcome back for day four. Um, I hope you're all singing ready. You've done a little bit of a shoulder rolling, you've stretched out your necks, take a deep breath, blow out the candles, okay, and you're um, nice and relaxed, back and down with your shoulders. Today we're going to be looking at an exercise which starts with large intervals, so going up through the fifth to the octave and ending up being chromatic, so all the notes very close to each other. So, and we're going to use the sounds B ba B ba B. So I'll do each part of the exercise and you can follow it after me. So we start like this. Be ba be ba be with me. Be ba be ba be. Close it to a triad. Be ba be ba be. And then we close it to the first three notes of the scale. Be ba be ba be. And then we do the first five notes of a chromatic scale. Be ba be ba be ba be ba be. So you've got different intervals to navigate different different positions. So let's do that all together as a flow. Here we go. Be ba be ba be triad. Be ba be ba be scale. Be ba be ba be chromatic. Be ba be ba. So the things to remember are shoulders back and down, a brightness and a lift in the face. We're slotting those notes in, um, remembering whether we've got big jumps or whether they're much closer together. Okay, try and be as accurate as you can. Shoulders back and down, and here we go. Be ba be ba be. Be, 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 be. 
In fact, we're going to stop there, but we're going to work our way back down. And this time we're going to do it as a flow. So we're not going to have the long notes in between. So you take a breath wherever you need to. Okay, join in when you're ready. Beep, boop, beep, boop, beep. When you like. But try and only take one breath, uh, one extra breath in between. Let's do one more. Hello Sligo family, Shannon Barnett here. Today we're going to learn about an excellent musician by the name of Mary Lou Williams. <laughs> Mary Elfrida Scruggs, as she was first known, was born in 1910 in Atlanta in Georgia and later moved to Pittsburgh. Uh, she was self-taught, started very early with piano and at age 12, I think, was already on the road touring as part of the vaudeville circuit. Uh, she later joined Andy Kirk's 12 Clouds of Joy or Clouds of Joy, had various names, uh, and was traveling as well with them um, in her late teens. So from the very start, um, a, yeah, a really, really interesting career. <laughs> I would work for you, slave for you, work my body to a grave for you. If that ain't love, it's got to do until the real thing comes along. Andy Kirk's Clouds of Joy were a band that were known, known as a territory band. So they were bands that would travel around certain territories, basically, in the United States. And uh, one of those territories was Kansas City. They played there a lot. And Mary Lou got the opportunity to, to hear what would become actually the Basie Band. Um, she also went on to become an arranger for the Basie Band, as well as for many other people, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Benny Goodman, Cab Calloway, and Duke Ellington. <laughs> Very well known actually for for hang, hangs at her apartment <laughs> so she had an apartment in Harlem where lots of people would hang out and discuss music and talk about different approaches including people like Thelonious Monk and Dizzy Gillespie, Jack Teagard and Sarah Vaughan, uh, Bud Powell so yeah it was really it was really a hot spot uh, in those days. <laughs> Career, she moved to Europe and performed and recorded there with many people uh, before un unfortunately suffering a kind of burnout and uh, she made it back to the USA and then sought the help of the church and yeah as she got older her music became very much influenced by 
spirituality and religion. And you can hear that in some of her works, including Black Christ of the Andes. And I'll, I'll put a link uh, again at the end of this video with some, some listening tips. It was the end of her life. Mary Lou Williams became a professor at Duke University in North Carolina where she taught yeah, piano, but also composition, lots of different things. And she unfortunately passed away in 1981, but we're so happy to have the legacy of her wonderful music. Have a good day. Hi there, Phil Robson uh, with another uh, micro lesson. Uh, I'm going to jump straight in and talk to you about ballads today and looking at it from an accompanying point of view again, I'm going to uh, look at some soloing ideas in two of the five of these videos. But um, I'm thinking of all, almost as if I was playing duo with a singer or trumpet player or saxophone player or, or whatever it might be or even a another guitar player or etc. And um, I love playing ballads. Uh, it's one of my all time favorite things. I could play ballads for hours. Um, and I've thought about it a lot. So I'm gonna just share a few ideas and I'm gonna use a very famous tune called Body and Soul, which is often one of the first tunes, uh, ballads that jazz musicians learn because it's such a great tune. I'm just gonna, I'm just going to play uh, the first two A sections on my own as if I was playing duo and I'm going to see what comes up for me. Uh, I'm going to think about it when I'm playing and tell you what I was thinking about. Okay, so here we go. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Mm. So there you go. That's the first two A sections. Um, it's interesting playing uh, myself because um, obviously it'd be much easier with somebody else, but that instantly throws a few things, uh, you know, into my mind. And one is if, you know, if I was going to record this, I'd, I'd want to sit and work on it for a while to make the chords uh, change from one to another, even smoother. I was, you know, some were smoother than others there, but I think that's a great thing to work on as a guitar player. Um, you know, so that we don't get this clunk changing from one chord to another. So, you know, just by really concentrating on the sound and trying to get as smooth as you can. Thing, uh, of course is the time and that's one thing that people find very hard when they first start playing ballads um, I'll say a couple of things to you there these are things I've thought over the years two things are one is simplicity the second thing is don't be afraid of beat one <laughs> there's nothing wrong with beat one and especially if it's duo sometimes it's the nicest beat you could play uh, just to make something solid the other thing is uh, how you feel the time. Now I've heard uh, great musicians, really great musicians, tell me that they like to think of it in a triplet way, uh, almost like this, one and uh, two and uh, three and uh, four and uh, one, two, 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 like a triplet thing. Um, try it. If that works for you, that's great. Um, that tends to make me hear it when I'm playing it and makes me play a lot. It tends to make me play that way, but um, if it works for you, great. I tend to think of them as more even because I want to try and get a real still thing with it. So I tend to hear it like this. One and two and three. But that helps me just to, to settle the thing down. And I do play some triplets. Uh, the other thing you can do to fill things out is try moving fingers around. I do that sometimes. You know, if you want a little melodic thing. And it's also nice to play little simple fills behind the melody, like... Um, you don't need anything super complicated, just something that gives a feeling of forward motion and doesn't leave the other person out there on their own. It just gives support. So uh, I hope that's given you a few ideas. Thank you for listening. from the pub with more ideas to show you on the internet which I will try not to slur. Playing the time. I slur, slow, slur everything. I slow everything down as slow as I can possibly hear. I might think one triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet. And I'll keep my arm, the motion, going all the time. There won't be any straight lines again. And four, and, uh, and I'll just squeeze the sixth stick onto the cymbal. Five, three, and five, four, and squeeze and point. Point, two, three, two, three. The motion never stops. One, two, three, two. So we're going to trip this up here. Bring the stick back. Four, two, three. Then I play what they call the skip beat lightly by dropping it on the cymbal surface. Drop it 
And then for the jazz time, I leave out to the city. Da ba, di ba. And just get used to that feeling. Time and space again. And I have played that for days with no exaggeration. There are loads of ways of doing it. This is just one of them. There are so many ways. Um, you can either get slower from there, if you dare, or if you take it up a bit, there'll be slightly less motion. So if we play that obviously I'm not going to be coming up here all the time then because I haven't got the time so it'll just be the same motion but less of it Keep it dancing. It's not a science, it's an illusion. Take it up a bit more, less motion. Oh, let's think. Beep. As we begin to take it faster, we need to be able to use almost all fingers. So I'm putting the stick down on one and then on two, I'm dropping it. I'm putting it with the back fingers. I can't be quite difficult to do after a couple of fights. But I'm, I'm putting, dropping it and then putting it with the fingers. So I'm playing place, drop, pull, pull, drop, pull, pull. So faster, so I'm showing now is here. One, uh, one, two, three. to do is play one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, I'm pulling the stick through onto the cymbal. Again, that's just the way I do it. Maybe it works for me. If I get lucky, it does. See you again. Ta-da! Hi there, I'm Federico Blaman and welcome to my channel. Today we will be practicing on something that you requested. We will be playing 24 bass lines with the usual method listen and repeat on two chords instead of the usual one chord. In this case we will be using a harmonic progression that is widely used, 1 minor 7 and 4 7, just like Oye Como Va but in a funk version. Obviously, you will find the mp3 and the pdf in the video description. Let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to cover in the next videos. And now, let's go!
Thank mm-hmm. you.
So touching back where we talked about relative to your instrument and singing, I want you to show you a little just a way I would practice uh, the teenager or over the years when I was practicing, really getting into practice. And I would obviously have vinyl. So I was taking little bits of uh, whoever, Dexter, Rollins, Coltrane, whoever I was listening to, and taking little snippets and then singing them and then playing them. So I wasn't, you know, letting the instrument, I'm not constantly trying to find the note on the instrument. Again, find your top note. La 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 la. Ba da ba da da. So it's about as high as I, as I want to be going there. So you sing. So what you hear, sing it back and then try and relate it to the instrument. So you can start off by. Da, 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 da. So now I'm, I'm kind of relative to where the instrument is. So if I listen to now, just taking a random clip from Dexter and slowed it down. Da, bo, do, do, bo, do, da. Da, bo, bo, do, bo, do, da. So by singing it and relating it to the instrument, it really works. So every time I finish a note, so if I there from C, I have that in my ear, so it's relative to the next phrase I'm gonna play. So I'm when I'm singing it so singing is a huge part for me of being a better musician uh, so the instrument's not chasing the notes all the time you're not randomly looking going where's that note on the instrument use your ear and then practice with your instrument as a relative pitch to the, the instrument you're using. Howdy folks, and welcome back uh, to lesson four on the power of 40. This time we're going to apply the power of 40 to the blues. And of course you can apply it to any tune that you're practicing. Uh, best to start with the blues because you're not having to think too much about the harmony. It's a structure that we're all very aware of. So let's start 40 beats per minute. The 40 beats per minute. Nice slow lazy blues.
yeah, trying to focus really on our time feel. Yeah, trying to really focus on our time feel and locking in with the metronome, you're gonna find your time feel becoming rock solid. Hello again. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, kind of being a session musician um, and being a commercial musician. Now, there's no doubt um, that I'm a jazz musician in my soul. I'm first and foremost a jazz musician, um, but uh, I also love commercial music. Uh, I'll also love playing lead trumpet, um, and I'm very, very lucky to be able to um, be doing uh, quite a lot of uh, session work um, for various people. Um, and uh, just want to share a couple of thoughts on on you know be, being a kind of successful um, session musician. Um, one thing uh, that's really important um, is playing along with music, um, and th this will lead on to kind of the, the kind of session thing in a moment. Um, but one thing that really helped my jazz playing uh, growing up. Um, and I'm sure everyone would say the same as playing along with uh, recordings, playing along with records, um, CDs, MP3s, wh whatever, whatever uh, you call it now. <laughs> and anyway, and when I was growing up, it was vinyl records. Um, so playing along with the records, um, because there's a couple of things that does for you. Uh, one is you can kind of copy the the people that you're trying to play with. So if you're, you know wanting to play along with like a Clifford Brown record or a Miles Davis record or a John Coltrane record or whoever it may be if you're a piano player Herbie Hancock record um, you know take inspiration from the recording maybe even copy some things bit of transcription maybe maybe play along with the solo and um, because you know when you're playing when you transcribe a solo it's not just it's not just the notes you're transcribing it's the essence of the music you're transcribing the way they play the notes the, the kind of inflections they put on the notes it's not just about the notes um so play, playing along with the recording is really really important um but the other thing that it does for you is it keeps your time really good because you've got to play in the groove that they're playing in um, and for me that kind of led on to um, how to be a good session musician the the most one of the most important things maybe the most important thing there's two 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 really important things uh, for me it's time and sound um, and time and sound um, they, they're the two biggest things that you kind of need to work on as a as a kind of you know session musician as it were um, so playing along with a metronome is really important if you're able to record yourself um, into one of these programs like Logic or GarageBand or Pro Tools or any of those things um, it really shines a light on on you as a musician how in time you play to the click um, and the sound that you make and also the your, your intonation your tuning um, so you can't really let yourself away with anything um, when you're when you record yourself. Um, so there's a couple of things I would recommend. Record yourself playing, could be anything, could be a jazz solo or uh, even better still, uh, a part. So this is, you know, maybe quite horn, you know, trumpet centric, but maybe if you've got like a trumpet section uh, worth of stuff, you know, track up all the parts if you can. Um, and you, you, you want to concentrate on the time, um, the sound and the intonation. Um, not necessarily in that order, but certainly for me, t time is probably going to be at the top of the list. Um, so yeah, how tight can you play with that click? Um, and, you know, I think also if you're tracking up stuff at home or if you're doing stuff in a studio, even with other musicians, it's not a bad idea to use a tuner because uh, it kind of keeps you, it just keeps you right and then there's no there's no doubt about anything, you know. So especially if, I, if I'm at home tracking up a trumpet section for somebody, it just speeds things up um, for me to just, especially if there's like a long unison note held or a, or a, a long chord held, um, check it on the tuner, make sure that every note's bang in tune and do your best to just play completely in time. Um, so that's my thoughts on, uh, you know, the things to aim for as a kind of gigging session uh, musician in the industry. So there you go, hope that's uh, helpful. <laughs>